Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 457 that's 456 456 hope you guys are doing well wherever you may be you know 6 or 7 maybe 7 I'm not too sure which one it is but I hope you're good wherever you may be I hope you're good wherever you may be if it's your first time check out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're watching via YouTube, well, yeah, click subscribe, leave a comment down below watching for YouTube. If you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review will go help will go a long way to help spread the show. I've seen a lot of five-star reviews on there already, so thank you for those of you that have taken out the time to do your five-star reviews. And if you haven't already, please do. It won't cost you a thing. It'll take you no more than five minutes to do a five-star review on the Apple Podcast app for me. That'll help the show to kind of get pushed up the algorithm and make it more discoverable to other ladies and gentlemen such as yourself of course of course support via patreon is always more welcome to at patreon.com for slash agostino that's patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o you can get access to a patreon bonus show only available there that'll be recorded tomorrow and out for you so make sure you jump on there for that bonus episode that's coming to you tomorrow so please jump on patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o get involved today don't delay oh how are you doing anyway hope you're good wherever you may be I hope you're having a good time. It's now what about half seven in the morning on a Saturday. I'm quickly recording this before I go on my run. So um, you know, getting this is half the press. I don't have to, you know, do loads of stuff when I get back and shit. Cause I've got a lot of things to get on with, innit? A lot of things to get on with. Um what's been going on? Not really that much to be honest. Um I'm still training a bunch. Um still trying to get my, you know, my weight down and all that malarkey, I'm trying to change my eating habits. Um, which has been pretty decent um, I'm loving the new sleep schedule I have at the moment now like without even trying I tend to always kind of fall asleep before 1am and if you're wondering that's still super late trust me it's super early for me considering how crazy my sleep schedule was in the kind of um, early parts of lockdown middle parts of lockdown I was sleeping at like any time between 2am to 7 sometimes 8am right it was wild <laughs> really really bad habits were developed during that time but a lot of it again had to do with the gym um, you know, a lot of it had to do with working at home. You just kind of roll out of bed, you know, the first couple of hours, you're not really doing that much anyway. Um, you don't have to kind of travel to work. So again, you can always kind of cut it really close. And then of course, there's no real incentive to get up before your time to work because there's no gyms. Those are the main things that are waking me up because I think there is a portion of the community or there is a po portion of the population who have this thing where they don't mind going to the gym after work, which I don't get. I think it's insane. But I know some people live on the edge like that, right? They don't mind actually going to work, doing a nine to five, wherever it is that they work, and then coming back, changing, and then going to the gym, or at least changing at work and then going. So I just can't do that. The last thing I want to be doing is going to the gym after I finish work. I just want to go home, have some dinner, and you know, either get on with what I have to get on with or go to sleep. So I try to squeeze all my stuff in in the morning because I know usually that gives me the momentum to kind of do other things in the evening. If that means I do a double session, cool, but I need to get that morning thing in. And now that morning session has really helped me get my sleep pattern great. I'm probably not sleeping the requisite eight hours. I know I'm not. If I'm sleeping at 12, I'm only going to be getting six hours sleep, maybe less by the time you really get into some REM sleep and all that malarkey. But it's better than before. It honestly, is, um, there's nothing, there's no... um there's no better way to make yourself feel like a loser when you're waking up at like you know nine or 12 at in, in, a, in the afternoon on a saturday or something do you know what I mean? you feel horrendous you wasted half the day and um, we only get a one shot at this life of this thing called life that we have at the moment especially during this whole you know with the coof we've realized how fragile and um you know um how quickly life can change in an instant we need to really kind of savor these moments that we have. So the last thing I want to be doing is spending my time comatose, uh, you know, on my bed somewhere. Um, thinking about all the things I could be doing when I should be doing them. So that's basically what I've been up to. So that's been pretty decent. I'm not going to lie. I feel like I've got pep in my step. Much more energy than I had previously. And it's been raining a bit now. So hay fever has gone which I'm happy about, so I'm over the moon about that one, because the hay fever was absolutely kicking my ass this year, man, absolutely kicking my ass, um, what else have I been doing, oh yeah, so, um, I watched Michael B. J. Michael B. Jordan's movie called, no, Without Remorse, the Tom Clancy one, 
if you're wondering who Tom Clancy is, obviously um, famous for what's that game called? Um, Rainbow Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. Loads of kind of crime, espionage, thriller type books that he's kind of famous for and writing TV shows. I think back in the day, I remember the movie. Um, the Hunt for Red October with Sean Connery in it from back in the day about a submarine, I think, or a ship or something. And now he's got this new one called um, Tom Clancy's uh, Without Remorse, starring Michael B. J. Jordan. Michael B. J. Jordan, right? Is that his name? Yeah. And it's pretty decent. I'm not gonna lie. Um, don't get me wrong. If you're expecting a Tom Cruise s type movie acting role sort of thing, don't expect that. Um, although I do think Michael B. Jordan has proved with this role, and obviously when he did um. Uh, Black Panther that he can he can obviously play the like the psycho killer antagonist sort of dude in the movie really well and he can also play this action hero movie role guy pretty good too which is making me think do you do you reckon Michael B. J Michael B. Jordan do you reckon he uh, auditioned for what's that word called is it Inception or Inception what's the movie with them um, that came out recently with what's his with Denzel Washington's son I wonder if he auditioned for it because he might have been an actual good fit in it. Um, Denzel Washington's son, what's his name? That's it, John David, right? What did John David, John David Washington, what did he do? John David Washington, let's see what movies he did. Movies, I forgot the name of it, it's kind of escaped my head. Uh, Tenant, that's it. Do you think uh, Michael B. J. Jordan auditioned for Tenant? Because I reckon he could have done a really decent job. Because if you remember in Tenant, um, John David Washington's character doesn't really say too much. It's all kind of movements and, you know, expressions and whatever it may be. But it's not a dialogue-heavy movie, um, which is obviously something that I think, which a lot of people would probably say, Michael B. Jordan kind of lets himself down within it. His kind of delivery um, of lines and stuff isn't the best so I'm wondering whether or not he actually had a shot of being in this movie because I think he would have been an actually, he could have done a, a, a decent role in Tenant. I reckon he could have. Obviously, John David Washington was probably a better fit. I think the scenes of him running and stuff are really good because obviously he was a, what was he? A, he he was a, a high level doing American football. So there's a, it's just a really weird thing to talk about because, you know, who cares? But there is something about movies, action movies, I, like, I watch sometimes where when the person's running, it just kind of takes you out of it because you realise quite quickly that, oh, this guy isn't athletic at all. He can't run, do you know what I mean? He's not going to outrun anybody. But with John David, he, the way he moved his body and everything, you know, he's just looked comfortable in that sort of scenario. So I thought that was pretty decent. But anyway, back to Without Remorse. Decent movie, I'm not going to lie. I don't really want to spoil it too much because I think the trailer does anyway. But you kind of get the gist of it. Um... It's sort of about this army surgeon guy who essentially has a tragic life incident happen to him, which kind of makes him snap and question everything that he's held dear about the army, you know, and whatnot. And then he ends up getting recruited by another faction within the CIA, and then it kind of develops into another story. Um, funnily enough, um, what's her name's in this as well? Uh, what's her name? What's Thingy Majiggy's? Um, oh, what's her name? What, what, why am I always? Why's my, my head getting split now? What's her name? What's her name? Lauren London. That's it. Lauren London's in it. Nipsey wife. Nip Nipsey hustles. Um, would you call her widow? I was you say so. Now, I don't think they're officially married, but still, um, Lauren London's in it, and she's really good. I'm not going to lie. She's a fairly competent actor. Um, obviously, she's had a very traumatic experience. She's had to go through the last couple of years. I'm sure hasn't been the easiest for her. But I would imagine going on set and doing a movie is a probably a nice distraction from things in some respect. Um, but it, it was great to see her in this movie. Hopefully, she gets a few more roles going forward. She's always been really good in the sort of like black romancey type movies. Anyway, in general, I've always kind of liked her acting. Um, she's fairly decent in this. Um, obviously Michael B. Jordan like I said not the best they don't really give him too many lines he doesn't have to say too much but the action f sequences are awesome for somebody that likes um you know close combat gunfights and all that malarkey it's bloody brilliant I'm not gonna lie it's really 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 good and it's violent as hell super super violent so if you're a fan of it that sort of stuff I really recommend you check it out it's probably not going to win any awards anytime soon um it probably would have got it, I probably would have enjoyed seeing this in the cinema too just for the cinematic experience but you know watching on Amazon Prime is pretty a decent experience the UI and Amazon video player it, you know it's a bit shaky but it works pretty well 
so um, subtitles the ability to kind of scrub you know forward into on the movie and whatnot a couple of seconds it's a fairly decent i'm not gonna lie it's it's enjoyable i enjoyed watching it so if you've got nothing to watch at all oof, look at this review it gave it two stars <laughs> horses of courses in it um if you're into that sort of stuff action movies thrillers type stuff definitely check it out it's called without remorse it came out this year it came out a couple of weeks ago so um it's fairly recent so check that out if you're that way inclined what else did I get myself up to? Oh, I've also been watching Invincible. I just finished that actually. That's another Amazon original. Um, a cartoon or an animation, sorry, a based TV series about, you know, these superheroes, these group of serial heroes. Kind of similar, you would say, to... Um, what's the other one they got on Amazon? Uh, is it Bad Boys, Bad Guys? What's it called? Oh, my God. Why is my brain absolutely foggy today? Amazon uh, superhero tv show was it tv series was it called the boys yeah it's kind of similar to the boys in invincible in that it's sort of like a real world um interpretation of what it would be a representation of what it would be like to be a superhero right um it follows a, a band of these guys called the global guardians um who are essentially you know they exactly what they say in a tin they are global guardians and this one man called omni man who kind of is a bit of a rogue fellow that kind of you know hangs on his basically does his own thing and it kind of follows their trajectory um you know in terms of following or in terms of trying to save the world and the challenges around it and trying to live a somewhat normal life um it's really good i really recommend you check it out um very very gory very violent um there's a lot of kind of cringy you know um real world representation things in it but you can get past it because the story is pretty watertight supposedly it's based on an original comic which makes sense if you look at some of these early illustrations it's based on an actual comic book series that people um i guess really like but i really enjoyed it i'm not gonna lie it's very 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 enjoyable um to watch super funny bits here and there um good action sequences um storyline is really gripping and maybe I think because it's a cartoon on animation, you can just get away with more in it. You can just get away with more than you probably would do in a live action remake of this sort of stuff. But I really enjoyed it. Um, so if, again, if you're into that sort of stuff, really to recommend you check it out. Invincible, available now on Amazon or wherever else you stream your shite. Next on the list, what else do we have here? We have, oh, we have an update. We have an update. So this is courtesy of The Guardian. It says England's traffic light system for foreign travel, all you need to know. So if you're not familiar, obviously we're doing fairly decent in England, um, you know, in comparison to our European neighbours, which is insane considering how badly we were doing this time last year. Oh, no, this time is it much. Yeah, this time last year, considering how bad things were and then considering how good things were in Europe. Like I said, there were times in the summer of last year where there was parties happening you know in berlin and stuff the new grease miller opened um this time last year people were having open you know open air parties all over the place djs playing all over the place and people were traveling to berlin to go and rave and shit and i was even thinking of going and it was completely bleak here right no clubs no bars were open it was just you know locked down everywhere loads of restrictions and then for some reason it kind of flipped and now we're in a good place mostly down i guess to the vaccine and the extensive lockdown right which basically prevented people from kind of mingling and you know transmuting the virus in certain places we had some border control but not really we had a whole quarantine hotel thing so we've done quite a lot of things that have basically led to the point where we're at now where there is a possibility that we could have all restrictions lifted within a couple of weeks not a few weeks yeah, on june 21st so that's about six weeks away or something so ahead of that there's going to be another lifting of restrictions on may 17th which is the ability for people to then travel to countries that are deemed to be safe and that would obviously still require you getting tests and stuff but there's created this little traffic light system which is obviously from red amber and green and um, green meaning you don't need to quarantine i think amber meaning you do need to do tests and stuff and whatever it may be and then red obviously meaning that you can't go at all um so this is a breakdown here from the guardian it said what was announced foreign trips almost completely banned at the start of 2021 as the uk went into another national lockdown in the face of a biggest wave yet 
coronavirus cases and deaths but ministers say that soon people in England will be allowed to take trips overseas again to go on holiday or visit family and friends that they may have not seen since the pandemic again the air corridor system introduced last summer um, that allowed people to skip quarantine if it's returning from relatively safe countries has been replaced with a new traffic light system green amber and red lists have been created with all countries graded depending on the factors including their vaccination rate there's also going to be uh, there will also be a green watch list designed to help give people a Early warning that a country is at risk uh, being moved off the green list. Given travel is a de devolved matter, the administration in Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland will decide that there, when the, the new rules are coming forth, 17th of May, until people have to carry a declaration form bearing one small number of reasonable excuses, including essential work, education to provide care, or attend funeral or participate in elite sport. I think that's what do you reckon that's what a lot of DJs were doing? They were saying that they were uh, traveling for an essential work, right? Uh, so basically, DJs are essential workers. Insane, isn't it? It continues. What do green, amber, and red lists mean for travelers? The color list each country is on will dictate whether, where, dictate whether and where passengers arriving from need to quarantine. People coming from green list countries need a negative pre-departure COVID test, and they will not have to isolate at all upon their return. They will have to take a PCR test on a day or two after arrival. The PCR tests are specific, are specified, sorry, because they are more accurate than lateral tests. Um, those entering England from amber countries will need a negative um, pre-departure COVID test, have to isolate at home for 10 days and get a PCR test on days two and eight. They, they can still use the test to release system on day five, a negative test result, meaning that they end their quarantine immediately. Travelers arriving from red countries will need a negative pre-departure COVID test, undergo managed quarantine at a hotel for 10 days that cannot be cut short and get a PCR test on days two and eight. The government said people should not travel to amber and red countries for leisure, of course. So if you wanna see your family, all well and good, Take the, take the test, spend the money. But if you want to go to Magaluf and party it up, or if you want to go to Ibiza and hang out with Wayne Lineker, you have to kind of give that a bit of a jog on. The countries on the green list are Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Brunei, Iceland, Faroe Islands, Gibraltar, Falkland Islands, Israel and Jerusalem, South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands, um, St. Helena, Ascension and Tristan de Cunha, Portugal, including the Azores and the Madeira. So all the hottest countries that you'd want to go to, <laughs> I'm joking. There's not a lot of options there, really, if you actually want to go and travel a bit, to be completely honest. But still, better than nothing. Um, Portugal, I'm assuming that rule still applies where you can use drugs, right? Is it? Well, I'm, I'm sure somewhere I've read somewhere it said that Class A drugs are legal in Portugal. Class A drugs, legal, uh, Portugal. Let's see. I'm pretty sure it was like you have to carry personal use. Uh, was it like 3.5 grams or something? Drug decriminalization. I see this. This is a Portugal regular radical drug policy is working. Why hasn't it worked elsewhere? Da, 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 da. Avera Pereira. The crisis began in the South, in truth. What is it? I don't know what it says here. Let's see what it says. Mythbusters. Drugs are not legal. I don't know. But I think that's true. But anyway, regardless. Um... It's good, man. We've seen some movement. We've seen some no return to some level of normalcy with these green lists. I'm sure. I don't know. I think I assume most people were not under the impression that they were going to be able to travel, travel this summer. I don't know. I think some people were a bit naive in that respect. Because if anything, this quarantine or lockdown has basically led me to come to realization that I should never be astounded or shocked about people's interpretation of events some people just view the world completely different or view things completely different than how i'd ever view them so i'm sure there were some people out there who generally did think that they were gonna go to you know spain and party up this summer or something and have a really jolly or good time despite what's going on there in their own country right they had elections recently the rates are super high still um you know they're still on a bit of a knife edge i'm sure some people generally thought no it doesn't matter i can still go to flop and tour and enjoy myself and whatnot um which is insane to think um, and i think considering everything's going on you're still going to be able to travel within the you know english shores or british shores wherever it may be um you know without really much any restrictions at all apart from maybe putting on a mask in an enclosed area such as a train or whatever maybe or a restaurant before you're eating which is insane to do but hey you gotta do that and just kind of you know tick the boxes but 
you can fairly you can still have a fairly decent returning to normal summer and end of year so yeah it might not be the best going forward but until our european neighbors catch up it's going to be a little bit tight anyway everywhere isn't it it's going to be a bit tense and again like i said it's even though you don't have to quarantine you're still going to have to i think per person depending on where you are you're going to have to shut out anywhere between 100 to 300 pounds per person to get your test done in that right ahead of time um depending on if you're in the place where they get them for free but some places they most places i think charge so you're gonna have to get your test done i think it's free tests right one leaving um one going one coming back and then two when you come back so it's four actually four tests you're gonna have to get done so it's a lot of money you're gonna spend to go which is um ironic too because it means that the lockdowns negatively affected people from poorer communities right because you know it is what it is and then now that the world's reopened the people who are going to benefit the most are the ones with the most disposable income because they're going to be able to pay the the fee needed to get the pcr test done um they're going to you know need whatever if they want to avoid going on trains and whatnot they can get an uber to the airport and whatnot so it's going to be a completely different reality for some people some people are going to be able to go legitimately to new zealand and singapore and all these countries that are on this list right and just have a, a legit ho a legit holiday because why not i'm sure going to iceland this summer wouldn't be that bad of an idea Faroe islands portugal's pretty nice all these places are decent jerusalem and israel i, I wouldn't mind to visit um but then me and you the regular folks are gonna have to slum it over here and pretend that we really enjoy going to places like Devon and stuff. <laughs> oh, what can you do? What can you do? Um, next on the list, what else do we have here? Oh yeah, we have this. Um, this is a bit of an odd one and something that I'm kind of ashamed to talk about here, but fuck it, you know, sometimes you have to be a bit cringe and give yourself the flowers whilst you're here. So I saw this really thing, this really cool thing on my feed the other day from Virgil Abloh where he posted um, this image. Um, this is courtesy of his Instagram page that says the following. Um, at Rob1970, leading conceptual artist from my school of thought. The first object just launched now via Canary Yellow Art Store, the art object outlet for the motley crew of artists I roll with. Robert Cristofaro, obviously from um, A Life fame, born 1970, American artist, small compact carton cutter, um, New York City 2020. And obviously, what you see in the picture here is Rob's interpretation of a carbon cutter, sorry, of a carton cutter. Um, it's got his kind of, you know, acron or his logo or his name here, Rob 1970. Um, embossed on the outside with an engraving of 2020 written there an addition out of 200 i think that one's number 49 you got some images there of the book cutter you got it here in the box itself it looks pretty decent stainless steel all well and good right so i was thinking you know what i'm gonna say credit for this collaboration because i think i was the person to introduce rob from a life and a well rob from a life and virgil for the first time or maybe re them but i think it was for the first time when i had when i was working at my previous place you know a few jobs ago maybe it was six seven years ago um obviously i was in charge of leading um or i was in charge i was put in place to co-produce a streetwear program which basically meant you know i kind of had to dip into all my contact books of people that i've known and grown up with or looked at when i was doing my thing and kind of you know ask them that hey if you want to come on this course where virgil abloh was the kind of lead curator the lead lecturer in this right it was very new at that time something a bit fresh i think it kind of built upon something jeff staple might have done ages ago but you know that's jeff staple he's a bit lame so no one really cared <laughs> so the idea behind it was to give brands all over the world access and resources to information that they probably wouldn't have if they didn't live in a metropolitan city and obviously access to some of the biggest and brightest brains within streetwear and fashion and menswear whatever it may be and the idea was to get them from inception to delivery so they can take their idea or they had in their head for a streetwear brand and take it all the way to how it would look in the rack and how you'd get it in the shop and how you'd sell it um and obviously um you know uh, i was able to kind of pull in some favors go through my contact list and got some names and one of the names that i pulled out that i thought would be really good obviously because I'm, I'm a big fan of a life um i remember going to the a life store 
uh, when I went to New York in the early what late 2010s or something around that sort of line um i bought quite a few jumpers as well for my from back in the day i don't know was it for life no it wasn't for life it was from a good hood sample cell but i did bump into um rob from a life in new york back in the day um i forgot the sneaker store that they had that was all brown and mahogany that was linked to them i think it was rivington rivington or something right do you remember that store that was linked to a life that had all the things in it i remember having the adidas's the a life adidas's back in the day to the red um zx 700s i think for back in the day and anyway rob's just generally a very much very much a bit of a legend obviously um he has a child with Liam McSweeney from Married to the Mob so they are essentially streetwear royalty in that respect right they 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 cut from a different type of cloth from that back in the day um what they called it streetwear mafia days right from back in the day if you remember that era um smash the like button so I think I was the first person to reintroduce these guys in a working capacity. And then Virgil Abloh ended up flying out, Rob, to his show in Paris, which I went to attend. I think that was full winter. That might be full winter 2015 of Off-White, if I'm not f mistaken. The one where Ian Connor runs down the runway. I was there for that one, standing on the side. Obviously, didn't get a seat. Not that special. Um, I think it was Off-White. Is it Off-White Men's 2015? Let me see think so of why men's 2015 let's see if it feels that one it was yellow the floor the, the 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 kind of set design was yellow okay it's not too was it 2017 it didn't feel like i feel longer more long than that okay maybe it was 16 then is it 16 is it 16 2016 yeah that's one it was 2016 this collection if you remember that, uh, let me see if I can find it actually. Did, 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 did. Yeah, it was, the, it was definitely this one. I got it here already on the list. Let me get it up on here so you guys can see. But this was the one, yeah. So around this time, I um, obviously enlisted um, Rob to be one of the guest curators. Um, so I guess lecturers on the program, you know, to work um, with Tandem, with Virgil in terms of, you know, helping out some of the brands that are on the streetwear program. And then I guess throughout that communication or throughout that kind of time, um, Rob and Virgil got talking again. Virgil ended up inviting Rob over to Paris to come, you know, just hang out, vibe in the studio as he always does. He's always kind of, you know, helpful that way, always collaborating with people and reaching out to people that he feels can kind of add something to the overall vibe of what he's doing, maybe inform some of the last minute decisions of clothes that go on a runway. And yeah, he was here somewhere. I'm pretty sure I was on standing somewhere towards that right hand side of this, but I'm pretty sure I was the first person to reintroduce these people back together. So when I see stuff like like this i'm i forget i feel a bit of pride i'm not going to be i'm not going to be honest i want to give myself a pat on the back for that um and then of course it's available on his site you know you've got virtual have site here um you know all the points that he's sort of working on you know maybe create to see awesome hard working dude and then of course there is the box cutter itself marked at 15 pounds that you can purchase obviously it's you know practical and also a bit of an art piece in itself as well so a fairly decent little object there but yeah i saw that i was thinking you know what I, I think i'm responsible for this i think i might have led to this collaboration actually going on so you know in an in an era where everyone is eager to give people their flowers i'm gonna give myself flowers for doing a sterling job this is probably my the best job I did actually working in a place somewhere that wasn't my own thing. Obviously I do um, pretty decently in terms of the stuff I do myself, but in terms of doing an actual work job, nine to five clocking in, that was probably the best performance I was able to do mostly because it was something that I kind of, you know, I've always did, loved in it when it comes to streetwear, something I've kind of been obsessed with from when I was super, super young. So it came really easy to me in that respect. Just a shame that it ended in a somewhat shitty way, it pun intended. <laughs> if you know, you know. But yeah, big up Rob, uh, big up Virgil. Um, collaboration looks pretty sick. Big fan of it. Glad they're still going strong and still friends and all that malarkey. Moving on, moving on deep, moving on, moving on deep. Oh yeah, we've got this. This is courtesy of Vogue. Uh, Billie Eilish sat down for a coming out interview sort of thing, I guess, where she's essentially um, shedding her old skin and embracing her sensuality, sexuality and womanhood. It feels like um, she's kind of, you know, um, donned in this weird latex um, corset thing that I don't think really looks that great in my opinion. But again, I'm a dude. What do I know? The interview is fairly illuminating, um, not really considering she's only 19. 
um, you do get the kind of sense that she's kind of figuring out herself and, you know, what she stands for and that malarkey. But just in terms of an aesthetic, right? Because I understand the need for, again, I'm not really the biggest fan of her music. I don't really listen to it. It's not really made for me anyway. But in terms of just um, progressing your career as a mega pop star, this is just kind of part and parcel of the game, in it, right? You look at Madonna who kind of maybe laid the blueprint of this sort of stuff, she basically reinvented herself, maybe more than every decade, right? Probably every five years, maybe less than that. She always had a kind of a reinvention of her sound, of her look, of her aesthetic, you know, of her vibe. Everything was kind of, you know, um, ripped apart and put back together again. So I guess in the kind of microwave era that we're in at the moment, if you're Billie Eilish and you're, you know, you've got the attention of the kids right now, there's no guarantee that that's going to last because it only takes one girl going on TikTok and having some sort of viral smash and all of a sudden people are forgetting about you or kind of diminishing what, you know, the influence that you've had in the industry. So you kind of always have to keep reminding people and keeping it fresh, right? Lady Gaga is really good at doing that too. Um, so I understand the need to do something like this, but the shoot itself and the actual styling and the set design and photography is pretty crap personally i don't know what it is i don't know if it's like a um uh, i don't know if it's sort of like an indication of where we're at now societally in terms of art and whatnot or in terms of image making in general but it's just not interesting it doesn't really wow you it doesn't really announce that she's on the you know that she's on the that, that she's kind of evolving as an artist if anything that picture that she kind of got papped outside of her home i think where everyone was kind of shocked that she had boobs right um because i guess she keeps wearing really baggy clothes so no one had an idea what she actually looked like and then i guess in a documentary or something interview she basically said that hey i never really felt that comfortable people kind of you know google kind of what's that, um, eyeing up my body in that way i didn't want to be objectified so i kind of purposely done these bigger pieces of clothes right these uh, extra large t-shirts right it's kind of early 2000s hip-hop scene sort of stuff early money uh, early sort of like cash money sort of vibe right which is commendable too because it means that she got into music for the right things she got into it for the artistry and you know um she didn't want any unworld toward attention coming or judgments coming toward the body so she decided to kind of essentially encase herself in this massive cocoon of a t-shirt and big trousers and massive shoes and whatnot and just kind of got larry with her makeup some more and her hair that was about it and then did the absolute business in front of the microphone so commendable but i don't know there's just something bland and weird and frumpy about this it doesn't really scream i've arrived and like i said i think that picture that she got papped outside of her home um, in the easy slides where people saw her kind of side profile and saw her boobs is probably more impactful than these pictures and that was a fairly mundane picture of her just popping out in her pjs you know whatever going to her shops this is i don't know it just doesn't do anything for me um and she's gone she's radical change too right she's changed her um her kind of two dye sort of like hair that she has i think she mentioned in an interview it took like four dyes to get this you know platinum blonde sort of style she's obviously a very striking um girl in terms of looks wise right obviously clearly very very attractive but in terms of the sh the shoot it doesn't necessarily announce anything for me it looks a little bit burlesque I don't know, but it's a bit less great. It looks a little bit better. I don't know. It looks it looks a little bit. It just looks frumpy. It doesn't look that great. Maybe this picture on the cover is fairly decent, but still the corset. Considering you're going to arrive somewhere and you're still kind of entombed, I guess she mentions in the interview a little bit where she's like, "I know people are going to be upset that you know I'm still where I'm wearing a corset, so I'm not really showing skin." And she's obviously battling this sort of like oh, I'm not really a body positivity person. Yeah, because I think that's probably what she's at. The, the the problem, the kind of clash here is that because she was wearing baggy t-shirts and big trousers and trainers and shit, people just immediately assumed that she was body positive. But she's not fat, is she, right? She might be um a little bit big boned in terms of she's got like a frame on her, right? But she's not fat girl. So maybe people wrongly interpreted her need to kind of cover up and not have people, you know, staring at her goods because she just wanted to be private in that way and just interpreted it as her being um, into body positivity, which is obviously something that you have to tread lightly on because that whole subgenre or that whole, you know, um, subsect of people are very sensitive when somebody who they deem to be in their camp then decides to kind of, you know, get fit and get thin and get healthy, quote unquote. It does necessarily rile them up, which I understand, to be honest, because I think 
societally, if you're a bigger person, every single day your existence is kind of being questioned, right? Your right to basically breathe and to enjoy yourself and to, you know, whatever it may be, it's just always getting questioned. So when you have, if I have somebody of a higher profile representing you, it can kind of feel quite empowering. And then when they suddenly decide to jump ship and, you know, do what everyone else is doing and just live a, you know, a skinnier life, quote unquote, it can really get you angry. I think it's the same thing happens to vegans. You see them a lot on YouTube. Those vegan YouTubers who, you know, was will make a video about, oh my God, I was suffering. I had this breakout. I was had a headache and I had to eat meat and da, 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 da. Vegans get so angry with that sort of stuff because, you know, having, leading that kind of lifestyle, or plant-based lifestyle, raw lifestyle is, you know, not for the faint hearted, but it's also something that they feel very deeply about in terms of, you know, how they view the world. And when you kind of go against it, you're essentially going against their whole reality. It just doesn't really bode too well. But again, the cover's fairly decent, but I think the rest of the pictures are just a little bit meh. And I'm also curious as to whether or not this actually means it's going to lead to actually interesting music. Not interesting, no, I take that back because some people think it's interesting. But it's going to lead to actually an evolution in her sound, let's say. I don't know if that's actually the case. Maybe it does. Because even the shoes aren't that great. Like here, the heels, what, well, what are these things? They look just look terrible, innit? I don't know, it just looks really bad. Maybe it's just me. I just don't think it looks that interesting. Like and again, she looks really awkward in this stuff. Maybe it's just because she's it's legitimately might be her first time wearing this sort of stuff and, you know, posing in front of camera. This sort of that like lace lingerie sort of corset thing. Um, it can be very awkward to do these shoots well. But it just doesn't look that great, personally, in my opinion. I don't know. Maybe I'm just kind of reading too much into it. And again, this thing with the coat, like, it could have done with just maybe having the tights on and maybe taking off that corset and maybe having a top on just to kind of expose the midsection a bit, show a bit more skin. She's got this great tattoo here, which obviously not, none of us have ever seen because she's fairly covered up. But I don't know. It's just a bit bland. Maybe it's just me. It's just a bit bland. Again, maybe it's um, it'll take a couple of these shoots for her to get comfortable in her own skin and to kind of decide what she wants to do and who knows this might just be a little shoot it might not even be an answer it might not be an evolution of looks she might just decide to go right back to normal but there is something about this new age of pop stars like her Dua Lipa and stuff like maybe not her but yeah Dua Lipa is a good example like music is fairly decent but personality wise like they're just like they got the personality of a cardboard box in it like there's nothing behind it it just feels a little bit empty that's why sometimes when they try and do the whole bad girl thing it's just a bit cringe um, at least with Miley Cyrus you get the talent you get the singing voice and you get a genuine personality whether you like it or not right um, I'm sure a lot of people in hip-hop don't really like her you know her comments on twerking and all that stuff after she you know dipped in got a bit of hip-hop money and then dipped out again but at least she has something some je ne sais quoi do you know what I mean there's something about her she's an interesting person that like you wouldn't mind bumping into her at a bar somewhere do you know what I mean you'd have a good time but these ones are a little bit I don't know they're a little bit a little bit man maybe it's just me maybe it's just me leave me a comment down below if you think i'm right or wrong i'd love to know your thoughts and opinions next on the list we have interesting news regarding clubhouse and this reintroduction well this um, announcement that they're going to be into funding 50 pilot audio shows for creators which i think is a sign that the app is dying whenever you see a new service app uh, platform um, push out all these new initiatives that kind of favor the creatives and answer some of the questions and criticisms that are levied at the app prior that you know a lot of people were basically complaining in the early days of clubhouse when a lot of the urban community were on there basically making it what it was and creating loads of viral moments people are complaining that oh these cut this company will be though i think a lot of people that had early conversations with clubhouse they were being very stingy um in terms of sharing any sort of like revenue splits or whatever they they could in terms of you know just just um you know um giving people bags in terms of getting the eyes and ears on the app and of course as time has gone on and the usage of the app overall has kind of gone down and the hype is basically stagnated they've now decided that they maybe do need these influencers and creators who were the backbone of this app especially because it's exclusive and no one can get on there unless you have a friend that's on it already now they're suddenly deciding to launch this funding of the 50 pilot audio shows on there but in my opinion i think it's a little bit too late um i always said from the very beginning that i thought clubhouse was way overvalued when the people were talking about it being a billion dollar 
uh, um, app that when it was going to be listed on a, you know, when it went pub, when it was going to go public in the first time, or think of people investing in. I remember there was an article around it being valued at somewhere close to a billion or over a billion, which was absolutely insane. I thought part of the reason why it was very successful, similar to um, what's that other one called? Is it Garage or something? What's it called? I don't know. But it was another um, voice conferencing sort of app that was very popular in the beginning of lockdown. But most of it had to do with the fact that we were basically, you know, confined to our apartments, to our homes um to our family houses to our bedrooms to our dorms for the most part of this lockdown and we didn't really have any other way to entertain ourselves apart from you know exchanging you know voice memos on instagram or whatnot and maybe chatting you know if we were allowed on the app such as clubhouse and in the moment the world started to open these apps started to dwindle in terms of their ability to hold our attention and the fact that you know they're all in real time you can't listen to anything on demand and all that malarkey but by and large it only really succeeded because we're at home and I was just wondering, how are they going to scale this if we then decide to reopen the world? Like, what happens then to Clubhouse? Like, who's going to be using it as well? That's going to be another introduction too. And in general, I just didn't enjoy the experience. I thought, you know, there's already enough social media platforms out there if you do come along you just have to do something really interesting in what in terms of what tiktok are doing in terms of the content that's on there right you don't really find tiktok content anywhere else on the internet it just exists on that one app so it's fairly unique in that way and then of course the feature itself is easily copied right and that's why you've got twitter have got their spaces facebook is going to launch something like clubhouse which is going to be insanely popular if you compare it to what Clubhouse has been able to do especially when you think of all the mums and dads and family members that you have on Facebook who are always ranting and raving about what whatever nonsense subject they're talking about imagine they're given the ability to host these audio chat rooms on Facebook with their groups and their pages that they're liking and stuff it's going to be insanely popular on, on stuff like that so essentially those other companies have basically um, you know removed any sort of unique selling point from Clubhouse which in, initially held they were very re resistant to kind of giving people bags in terms of them bringing eyes and attention to the brand so now they're having to play catch up now they're playing catch up so it says um here Clubhouse is funding the creation of a 50 audio shows made by creators on this platform. The concepts include everything from an interview series with Tyrion, with Terrin Southern, to I don't know who that is, to a pair of shows discussing the cultural hairstyles of a game show called Serial Killer Speed Dating. Oh, so cringe. The participants will each get 5,000 per month stipend for three months, plus gear and creative support to help them create the series. The goal is to develop and pilot each show over the next three months. If shows take off, this possibility Clubhouse will sign some of them to a long-term deal. This the first round of creators to benefit from the Clubhouse Accelerator program, which still, which it says will help support new voices and tools and resources to unlock their creativity in the platform. Clubhouse says that it's not taking any ownership of the content shows and the creative develop. The goal is to ensure that the creators develop, um, sorry, the creators themselves enjoy complete control and ownership of their creative output. So essentially, they're creating their own podcasting network, which is you know wild to think how it started. Clubhouse announced its accelerator program back in March ahead of its service um, first anniversary. Its popularity with the Silicon value venture capitalist crowd has led to the large amount of early buzz around the service that's arguably disproportionate to the mainstream popularity for example as of writing you still need an invite to sign up to clubhouse and it doesn't have an android app despite that the recent funding valued the company at four billion which is wild to think that and i don't think it's grossly grossly overvalued and then you look at this headline from nine to five mac clubhouse downloads plummet to nine hundred thousand in april as competition grows it says clubhouse quickly became a huge success in a year with reaching over 8 million downloads in the iOS app in February alone February alone 8 million downloads most of it was intrigue most of it was FOMO most of it was the need to be included you know you feel like you're not invited in this exclusive club but 8 million downloads in the month of February for iOS only is wild a news report claims that the app registered around eight nine hundred thousand downloads in April and dropping from its peak of nine point six million downloads three months ago. According to the Sensor Tower research shared with Business Insider, Clubhouse has nine hundred and twenty two thousand downloads globally in April twenty twenty one. This represents a sixty six percent drop from the two point seven million downloads in March and becomes even more considerable when compared to nine point six million downloads the Clubhouse had in February. Sensor Tower data suggests that the user retention of Clubhouse is 
is still strong which means the majority of users who download this still have the app installed which is not really interesting because i still have it installed on mine but I, i'd never ever open it however the significant drop in the number of downloads is worrying for the company as it means that fewer potential users as interested in the social network the company has tried to stay relevant by introducing a new feature to monetize live chats and even a program to help content creators but that doesn't seem to be enough to ease the competition in recent months companies like twitter facebook and linkedin i didn't know linkedin had one come on that's a that's a wrap if linkedin launch a clubhouse um alternative it's a wrap because the, you know if there's anyone that likes to hear the sound of their own voice it's people on it's people on linkedin telegram and even spotify have introduced their live audio platforms that do basically the same thing i just spotify have one as well i don't know okay cool twitter pacific has been doing well with its audio platform called twitter spaces um twitter finally and available um became widely available today to users on both ios and android meanwhile clubhouse remains a pretty much iphone only app as android beta version was only introduced earlier today despite the company being valued at 1 billion in january and looking for new investors the future of clubhouse is now unclear as it should be um but again maybe they might just carve a niche out for themselves similar to snapchat snapchat was always on the road people were always kind of counting snapchat out you know um, every year and they seem to always kind of turn it around so maybe they could do the same thing but i've always said from the very beginning i thought it was overvalued and now i'm basically being proven right i think when the world reopens people are going to completely forget about the app and just want to do anything but stay on a fucking smartphone for a prolonged period of the day they're going to want to go back outside you know get wasted hang out with people stop saliva and do all that stuff so um good luck to clubhouse <laughs> good luck to them good luck to them next on the list what do we have here oh yeah we have this this is brilliant news so over the last couple of days or, no, or yesterday actually um spacex successfully successfully um uh successfully launched and landed sn15 of their starship sn15 of the starship officially la launched and landed um the other day and it was absolutely amazing to watch we didn't get to see much of it because unfortunately it was somewhat overcast on the day um but in terms of just a spectacle and in terms of just an engineering feat and in terms of kind of you know i'm um, scratching that itch for myself being a big sci-fi fan and obviously being a huge fan of elon and what he's doing with spacex and all these other companies that he has it's just incredible to see actually happen um for once um it was fucking brilliant so i'm going to play a bit of the clip for you here a little bit so you can see some of the launch and lift off and then we'll continue on the other side <laughs> Look at that sound. Three Raptor engines going off. And then as it kind of goes up in altitude. Of the three Raptor engines as we're powering our way to 10 kilometers altitude in today's test flight. The little legs on the inside there. I think that's altitude down the corner and you can see it's just disappearing into the clouds i think i saw a tweet earlier too that elon said he's going to try and um uh, launch it again earlier uh, uh, later on today maybe so obviously they're going to have a uh, an ability to see if they can implement this rapid usability thing that they have going on here where the i think the goal is to basically land a starship and kind of have it ready within an hour or 45 minutes which is insane if they're able to do so just past one minute into flight we're through two kilometers altitude all three raptor engines continuing to burn next major event in about one minute is we will turn off the first of the three raptor engines Wow. T plus four minutes, 34 seconds. While we're working to regain video, it looks like we've got a shot looking back at the flaps on Starship. We're in the horizontal defense, descent phase now. We're passing. Then the belly flop position. Just imagine what that must look like seeing it in real life. Seeing something that's what? What is it? Is it like six stories high or something? The Starship, right? Without the booster. And then it sort of flips on its side, turns its engines off. And essentially plummets to the earth using its flaps to kind of like guide it insane seeing that in real life it must be wild to see that six kilometers and we have ignition 
with only two engines too which is interesting I, I, I wonder what that's about in terms of slowing it down so when it obviously flips on the side it then goes back up again vertically um, by turning on only two engines and then decides to slow itself down with those two engines to land you'd imagine you need three because obviously you need more propulsion to lift off because of the gravity but then of course the gravity coming back down again you need to slow yourself down in a certain way I don't know how it works engineering wise but it's flipping marvellous to look at look at that oh, let's go back again look how incredible that is and we have ignition starship heading back to the lander zone that's awesome man. that is so cool Wow. And Seth landed. When the smoke clears, you just see Starship standing there, supreme. A little bit of fire there towards the end, but look at that. Incredible, isn't it? That is so cool. And Starbase flight control is confirmed. As you can see on the live video, we are down. The Starship has landed. We're going through the safing sequence in the flight computer right now. We'll be back in a moment. But yeah, that's incredible, man. And again, not even a blip. Maybe it's because of Elon. People have this weird love-hate relationship with that guy. He's going to do uh, Saturday Night Live, I think, this today, later on today. Um, people already got their panties in a twist about that, which I don't really understand either. The show's dead already anyway. It's not really funny. Um, so having Elon on there do his awkward sort of like comedy, it's going to be pretty hilarious in, in all intents and purposes. He's got a lot of material that they can basically riff on, which, I, you know, I don't really see why people are getting their panties in a twist. But again, this didn't make a blip. Considering what's going on in the world right now, you'd think people will need like a great distraction, right? Um, from what's going on every day you'd imagine you'd imagine seeing um you know such a an amazing engineering marvel such as this something that you don't see in bloody you know what should we call it you don't even see in um you don't even see in them start in in sci-fi movies you'd think that would be enough but people don't care people really don't care when it comes to this sort of stuff i don't know why but what can you do what can you do let's see here what else time i've got that i've spoken about Let's continue here a little bit more. I don't know why. Why does it keep doing this? It never, sometimes you'll work a little bit, but then it won't work sometimes. I don't know why. Okay, let's move on. What else do we have here? Oh, yeah, let's just do, let's do this. We'll, let's give Supreme their flowers too, because these already have come out. Don't get me wrong. So they're not, it's not exactly new news here that I'm sharing with you guys. But I think we should um, give Supreme their flowers when it comes to sneaker collaborations, right? This is the um, Nike MX 96 that they basically re retroed. I think they came out originally. Yeah, they came out originally, obviously, in 96, but then they came out again in the early 2000, maybe recently. Maybe it was 2011. No, maybe it was 2017. Anyway, recently they came out and then they reintroduced them back again. And they tend to do this quite often. Nike, I mean, Supreme have a tendency of always collaborating with Nike and kind of pulling out some of the lesser known models and giving them basically, you know, life support um, and just basically reintroduce them back into the sneaker market again. And it's pretty cool. I pretty much, I pretty like it. I pretty like this approach because there is, I think in my head, if I was Supreme and stuff and you went to do collaborations that sell out, you could easily just, you know, keep doing any variation of the more popular air maxes air max one air max 90 95s um 97s what was it it's not, i'm not responding why is it not responding exit pages and oh my god exit the page just respond again yeah but yeah you could do any interpretation of those models and it'll be perfectly fine they'll sell out completely let's not even go on the side of jordan ones and jordan fours and stuff right you do those and it's complete sellout job every single time you drop but they purposely go for the more you know um lesser known model um just to kind of you know challenge themselves a little bit in terms of design and you can't fault them and especially this this looks great so they've taken this like here max 96 model which usually has these little kind of meshy bits on here on the sides where um and meshy venti type of bits and they basically made it transparent 
Um, and then obviously they don't look great with different color socks on them inside. But this is a fairly cool interpretation of a really, really um, overlooked, I think, Air Max in terms of the Air Max collection. It's got the same sole as an Air Max 95, but then it's got this amazing sort of like weird tiger stripe sort of like, you know, motif here on the side and um, with the one swoosh there on the heel. So again, making them translucent and then having the footbed or the insole, say Supreme on the N4. They've got obviously the logo on the back and on the front, which is something again I've said. I see Nike doing a lot more with loads of other brands. They obviously, obviously, they obviously always do it with the Supreme because it's Supreme, but they do tend to give loads of brands the opportunity to kind of you know emboss a little bit of branding on there, and make it a little bit different. So it's not just a colorway redesign, but they look awesome. I'd probably say my favorite is probably the silver. The silver is probably my favorite in terms of overall color. But like that silver looks incredible, isn't it? And it definitely it basically looks like the Air Max ninety seven silver bullet, you know, the OG, the kind of Italian number one shoe. But that looks great, especially with the clear bubbles in it. Like, oof, so 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 good. And I'm assuming somebody just does the sneaker collaborations at Supreme, or do you think it's at people that design the footwear or the design team in general? I'm not really too sure, but I'd imagine there is a committee of people that are basically in charge of putting these kind of things together and obviously the socks that that you can kind of buy separately you know batteries not included and shit and you've got the ogs here too to see to tell you how great this model is right it's a absolutely incredibly good model incredibly nice model sorry the actual colorways have come out being retro that haven't been the greatest i think the, the retro colorways are these i think which you know are not the best you've got this sort of like black and purple colorway the overall sh model and shape of it looks a little bit crap so maybe they maybe it's a re-retro that's been retooled because it does look a bit terrible in these pictures i'm not gonna lie let's see this quick view this is from what's that site se what's that sparse express or something whatever this website is express 149 pound for these shoes in black or what size do they have here they have all sizes jesus but yeah they look a little bit odd here isn't it maybe they did re-retro the actual model itself the shape because i think the supreme one definitely does look a little bit better than what these look like but the ogs look incredibly good you've got another pair that recently went on depop here that was sold in a size 5 and og kind of a flip on this colorway basically the inverse white and blue blue and white and obviously you've got that great cloudy bubble style thing that happens obviously when your um, air bubbles oxidate over oxidate over time Usually if you wear these type of things, the bubble will just completely, you know, burst on itself. So it's not the best thing to wear. But in terms of looking at, it's amazing, isn't it? Such a great shoe, man. Really, really great collaboration. And again, like I said, give Supreme their flowers for always going and trying to do the more difficult thing when it comes to collaborations and not just going for the easy win and grabbing a Jordan 1 or a Jordan 4 and then making it, you know, and then doing that and saying, you know, job done. So yeah, big up Supreme for that, big up Supreme for that. I think they already sold that now at the moment. So if you're trying to buy a pay yourself, then get on StockX or cry, your, cry into a pillow like I always do. <laughs> I mean, just keep it, keep it quiet. What else could we got here? We've done that, we've done this. Let's move on a little bit. Oh yeah, we've got this news. This is courtesy of New York Post. Obviously, you're familiar, you're aware that Bill and Melinda Gates have called it quits. I think they've said Melinda Gates is the person that's actually the one that um, filed for divorce, but it's been alleged, according to New York Post, that Melinda Gates is, you know, don't feel too bad for her. Supposedly, she's rented out a private island to avoid a divorce. I didn't even know you can rent out private islands. I knew you could maybe rent villas and maybe parts. I didn't know you could rent an entire island to yourself. It's just wild to think, in it? Um, some of the things these people get up to when you're ultra rich and wealthy this is why i also think i'm also bemused or you know don't really understand why people that have this level of affluence are the ones that are the most affected by trolls and haters online and go back and forth with people in comments i don't know i don't get it um if i was that rich i would just be in my private island you know minding my own business i wouldn't want to um converse with people online and be arguing with them in the comments that would be the least of my worries it says here from the new york post but in the billion million in the case i planned um to make their stunning divorce announcement in march and she hoped that she'd avoid the media glare by renting in a remote private island in granada so it was planned already okay cool so this was already worked out of course isn't it um two smart people they probably had all the i's and t's crossed um i's dotted t's crossed um it says here sources told tmz that melinda rented a cav 
Calvigny Island for a whopping 132,000 a night for her and her couple's children, as well as their significant others. Wow. But the Microsoft co-founder to whom she'd been married to for 27 years had not been invited to the 80-acre Caribbean island hideaway, according to the outlet, which reported that everyone in the family took the Melinda side. Melinda decided to go anyway, despite efforts um, by the couple's lawyers to hash out the um, settlement during the outlet, described, described as an unfriendly split, according to the according to the outlet. This is the interesting one, right? Because well, how old are they both? They're both in their, what, 60s, 70s, I'd imagine? It's re you don't really hear this too often about usually you hear somebody that's got like a trophy wife or a woman that's got like a sugar daddy deciding that she's had enough and she's bored but you don't really hear of couples that are you know in, in within the same age range who are incredibly wealthy right multi-billionaires or billionaires exactly i don't know if they're multi-billionaires but still you know more money than god insane amounts of wealth who decide that they're not you know, because they're not romantically in love that they're going to end their marriage usually it's a marriage of convenience it's like they've got so much business tied up together within their name or within you know what they've been doing over the years that it would probably cost them more money than needed to split up than it would be just to kind of work out some sort of amicable thing where i don't know um you know bill lives in another house she lives in another house and they kind of present a united front would need to get in camera but behind the scenes they're not really you know romantic or um in any way sexual or that would probably be a sensible way to go about things isn't it but this maybe is an indication that maybe things were so bad that he just had to do this there was no other option but again like i said it's not very rare you hear something that i would imagine usually you hear of you know again um the older guy who's got a trophy wife getting bored and going and grabbing another 22 year old when he's at like 80 or something but you don't really hear of two people that are in the same age range who've kind of come up together deciding that you know love is that important to them at that age which it probably should be because you know your children are all grown up you've got loads of grandkids you've got no one really that you need to kind of hold the family down for in that respect because i'd imagine you know if you're a little bit younger and you've got a young family there is maybe this responsibility you feel in your head to maybe not disrupt the house because you want to get your you know your pp wet you might just want to you know stay for the sake of the family which obviously isn't great you know doesn't necessarily bode for a nice household but interesting interesting approach um is obviously bill wasn't invited he said on the same day the announcement the separation bill's investment firm transferred 1.8 billion in stock to melinda the first indication of how one of the world's richest couples will divvy up their considerable assets insane so it's wild that they don't have a prenup but it looks like bill's still gonna have to you know cut the check which is interesting how marriage is working that way isn't it um the philanthropist couple announced a divorce on monday in a joint statement after a great deal of thought and a lot of hard work in relationship, we made the decision to end our marriage. Over the last 27 years, we have raised three incredible children and built a foundation that works all over the world to enable all people to lead healthy and productive lives. Their couple have three children who live mostly private lives. Okay, yeah, true. You don't really hear too much about them, innit? Rory, Jennifer and Rory and Phoebe, which is, which is what I would do. If my parents were Bill and Melinda Gates, the last thing I'd be doing is trying to be on some bad girls club, sort of, you know, E! Entertainment flipping reality TV show. I'd just be living my best life, keeping it humble, and just, con or even keeping it humble, just keeping it quiet. Do you know what I mean? Minding your business. But yeah, imagine renting a $132,000 private island so you can get some alone time that's madness and really most of the time if i want to get alone time i have to go walk in the park or sit in a prayer manger in order to flip him one pound fill of coffee and this woman gets to hide away in an island somewhere life sometimes isn't fair <laughs> oh jesus christ life isn't fair sometimes and then to end what else we have here let's end with this one i think might be some good news on the clubbing front we have another big club in london announcing their summer plans this is courtesy of ra said london's pickle factory announces summer season peter van hossen margaret dias Margaret Dagger, sorry, and more have tapped to open up the Cambridge Chief Club. Obviously, if you're not familiar, Pickle Factory is basically the sister club or the next door club to Oval. Um, a little bit smaller. I'm not sure what the capacity is, but if if Oval is two thousand, Pickle might be one or seven fifty. But it's still 
a great little venue, great little outdoor area. They filmed a couple of boiler rooms there, if you're not familiar, the little balcony canopy sort of bit. It's, they filmed a couple of bits in there. I've been there for a few different events here and there over the years, but again, fairly decent place to go to. If anything, the only thing that's annoying, the security can be a little bit heavy handed. It's a little bit excessive, the search, I'll say, if you know what I mean. Um, the drinks are fairly expensive too, um, especially when you consider where you're at. You're not in Shoreditch, you're in Cambridge Heath, which is basically near Bethnal Green. You'd imagine it'd be a little bit more fairly priced. I think a tin of flipping red stripe is like seven pounds or something insane like that. But again, um, for a club that's you know near a fairly easy to get to station in terms of the central line and the other lines that are next to it which i think it might be the district i think or something fairly good transport links buses everywhere it's a pretty decent location um usually a great lineup um entry prices can be a little bit excessive again 15 pounds and stuff considering you know where it's at and the lineups it can be a little bit too much but again one of our better clubs in london i'm not going to complain so the following uh, London Club Pickup Patch has announced the summer program kicking off on June 25th. The season is scheduled to begin with sets from Toe, Toe and Lauren. Have you the plans to Toe and Lauren? Um, truly Madly, um, Hamish and Toby, and other highlights can include Jane Fitz. <laughs> if you actually go, if you actually go and stand next to the booth and she, she says, <laughs> that'll be hilarious. <laughs> Just keep staring at her from the side of the room. Obviously, I'm not going to do that. Um, Don Atom, DJ Storm, obviously, a legend in the dubstep world. Dubstep drum and bass world, Sakari Sound, same two, Peter Van Hessen, OK Williams, and Margaret Diger. So, a fairly decent and hefty little lineup there, isn't it? I think there's a little animation here too on their Instagram showing some of the lineup and who's going to be playing from June to August uh, program. So, again, like I said, um, not a lot of big festivals announcing dates. Some smaller clubs obviously announcing some things. So, there's obviously um a kind of resistance from some places i'm going to these pages for some places to open up normally but i think if you do are going to go party this um summer your best bet obviously would be to go to some of these smaller clubs i don't think you're going to be able to go to anything else other than this coming up really to be honest um but again it's better than nothing man we have been without the ability to you know be in close proximity dancing to loud techno or electronic music for a while so whatever we're able to get let's not really you know kind of pour cold water over it too much um obviously that's the one invisible members all night long that's probably going to be a trash night but <laughs> it is what it is um this is probably going to be good and it? dj storm sakaria sound club fitness is going to be definitely one to get your sweat on on the third of july time down to batu bin uh, what is how do you call that beneath and anaya i'm not really too familiar with them djs you've got peter van hessen all night long that would be great i'm probably gonna go to that N nice bit of techno all night long you got six of um august dj pipe Pureta, krn sugar free you and we what's that you and e1 um pickle factory dj banana dj perception mc whiskey okay williams t dunn so some great um additions here i really like the artwork too who did the artwork by this guy called hangen schoenfeld awesome but yeah check it out um pickle factory you're going to be over here open this summer there's a list of all the people that are going to be playing on there playing there in that club obviously if you're familiar with it you'll know the vibes you will know the vibes anyway that's the exit signature episode number four five seven thanks so much for chaining in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if you just want to check out the show please make sure you smash the like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and i'll see you guys again next time be safe be well peace